I want to begin this morning uh, with a familiar story. I'm not going to go through all of it. I'm just going to pull, pull in the last couple of thoughts in the story. It's the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. It's the Samaritan woman. The Samaritans and Jews did not get along, but Jesus went out of his way to go to meet her. He, he knew that there was somebody that he needed to see in Samaria, and he sat down. He began to have this conversation with her uh, about her life and the nature of God. And so I, I just want to go straight to the end of that conversation where Jesus is speaking to this woman who is a, she's seeking God. And John chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus speaking to this woman, he, he tells her, the hour is coming and is now here. In other words, there was a time that was coming, but now it has arrived. True worshipers, if you got your highlighter, your pen, and your Bible, or you're taking notes, you can just highlight that and underscore that. The true worshipers. What does that mean? It could be there, there could be some not true worshipers. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is looking, searching, seeking for true worshipers. You find a lot of people saying a lot of things to God, but God is listening for and looking for true worshipers. And then in verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. I want to key in on that little phrase today, worshiping in spirit and truth. God is seeking a certain type of worship. I want to submit to you today that he is searching for weighty worship. True worship, weighty worship. Worship that has some heft to it. Worship that has a little weight to it. Worship that has a little something that just draws him close, something that is worthy of his attention. And, and I would say that worship is not synonymous with praise. Well, a lot of times we confuse those two things. We think when I sing in church, that's worship. It is, but that's only a small part of worship. That's praise. Praise is part of how we worship God. Worship is actually how we live. Worship is how, I'll say it again for everybody in the back. Worship is how we live. Worship is everything that we do. Yes, it is singing. Yes, it is raising our hands. Yes, it is clapping. Yes, sometimes it's dancing. It's also attending church. It's also giving. It's also how we raise our children. It's also how we treat our neighbor. It's also how we are known at work. All of that is, in fact, worship to God. Today, I'm going to ask that we just make up our minds that we're going to align our hearts today with one worshipful focus, and that is summed up in the phrase of this series, God, get the glory. God, I want you to get the glory. That's what we want to do. Would you focus your heart that way? Would you focus your mind that way? Would you just go ahead and make that decision? I want God to get the glory out of how I live my life. Amen. People live their lives all kinds of different ways, don't they? You ever done any people watching? Yeah, you do some people watching? Yeah, we like to do people watching. Where's where some places that you like to do people watching? At the mall? The mall's a great place to do people watching, sure. Restaurants? Absolutely. Absolutely. All kinds. And sometimes when you're watching these people, do you uh, imagine stories about them? Like, I wonder where they came from. I wonder where they're going. I wonder what they do for a living. Like, so you make up this little story about, oh, look at that cute couple. And you know they're, they're just newly together because they're holding hands and they're, or they got their arms around each other because they're like a two-headed monster. You know, so when, you have, when you have people that close all the time, you know that they're still new in a relationship. Uh, and, and so you're, you're thinking, oh, this new love, young love, right? And so you're trying to imagine how do they meet and uh, maybe you're going through all the romantic movies you've ever seen and, uh, and so on. And you're, maybe you're reminiscing about um, your, your past life and how you met your loved one and so on. Uh, maybe, maybe you're looking at them and you're, you're wondering, what were they thinking when they looked in the mirror this morning and left the house? You ever, you ever do that? I'm just being honest, okay? He's like, what, what were you thinking? 
you, you, did you think that looked good? Or did you look in the mirror? I don't know. It, it doesn't look like you looked in the mirror today. You just reached in your closet with your eyes closed and threw something on and left. People watching, we all do it, right? So does Jesus. Here's a story uh, about Jesus doing some people watching. And uh, it's interesting because this is actually takes place in the temple uh, in Jerusalem. And Mark's version of the story, we're going to read Luke's version in Luke 21, so you can turn there while I'm setting it up. Uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 1 is where we're going to go. Uh, but Mark, his version of it, tells us that Jesus is actually sitting in the temple. And that's a little bit unusual because in the temple, you weren't supposed to sit. You're supposed to stand. You weren't supposed to sit. Sitting is reserved for judgment. Well, look at the one who's sitting, right? He's like, it's my temple. I'll sit in it if I want to. So here he is. He's sitting, and he's watching people. We'll use a word that's a catchy word today that nobody likes, but this is what Jesus is doing, judging. He's sitting, he's watching, and he's judging. And history tells us that in the temple, as you would uh, approach one particular part of it where the offerings were given as you were going in for worship, there were 13 offering boxes outside of the temple. And they were large chests that had handles. You could pick them up and carry them so you could take them to the treasury and you know carry all the money out. But on top of this chest was a, uh, a trumpet-shaped receptacle. Okay, think kind of like the when you go into uh, some stores, they have like the little whirlpool looking things where you drop a penny in and it swirls around and around and around and around and around and around and drops in. You know what I'm talking about? Kind of like that smaller version on top of these chests. Okay, so you thought that was something that was invented like just in our generation. That's actually something that goes way back. So they has kind of this trumpet flared thing sitting on top of a chest and people would come through and they would offer different offerings to God. So sometimes it was mandatory offerings that they needed to pay, uh, some the temple tax or whatever. Uh, and then a lot of times there was free will offerings. And so different chests were for different things. And so when you walked in, you would tell the priest, I have an offering and this is what it's for. And they would say, go to this chest, go to that chest. And so here is this uh, this lady uh, in this story, uh, a widow, Jesus is watching all these people come by and drop their money in. And so you, you just know it's this flared trumpet thing sitting on top of a chest. You drop in some coins, and you can just hear them rattling around because it's wide at the top, narrow in the middle, then it drops in the chest. So you drop in some silver coins, and you can hear them rattle, 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 on all the, and down it goes. Keep that in mind. Here we go. Luke 21, verse 1, Jesus looked up. And he saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. He saw it. He could hear it too. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said to his disciples who were standing there, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. And all his disciples, they looked and they said, Whoa hold on a second, because I hear all the coins going in and rattling around, going down the little whirlpool effect and then falling into the chest, and it sounds like a lot. They put a, made a big show of it. And this little widow lady, she walked up and she just put in, I, I heard it very clearly, Jesus. It was just a plink, plink, rattle, rattle, drop, drop. That was it. It didn't sound like it was as much as everybody else. And he said, no, she's given more than all of them, for they contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in all she had to live on. I want you to get this for just a second, because this uh, we talked about what worship is. Worship is this way that we live our life. Worship is the way that we approach God. Worship is the way that we honor God. Worship is the way that we have glory to God. And it's this holistic view of all these different parts of our lives, including giving. And so all these other people that Jesus were watching were giving out of their plenty. Is it wrong to be rich? No. Is it wrong to have a whole lot of money? No. Is it wrong to have enough no, it's not. But that's how they were given. They were just giving out of what they had. It's like, we have plenty to give, so we're going to give. It didn't cost them very much to go to church. It didn't cost them very much to go into the house of the Lord and worship. It just didn't. They were happy to do it, which is great. But the widow 
the widow gave everything. I want you to put yourself in the mind of the widow, okay? She's by herself. She doesn't have a lot of income. She looks at her little purse, and she's got two little copper coins left. And she knew, today is the day I want to go and worship God. I I want to go and to worship God. I want to go and be with my people worshiping our God. If I go, I don't want to go empty-handed. I don't want to come before the King of kings and the Lord of lords empty-handed. I want to bring something to the house of the Lord. So if I'm going to go worship, it's going to cost me something. There was a bare minimum that you could give. There was a, the rabbis that set up a bare minimum. And you know what it was? Two little coins. So it wasn't like she could half it. If I'm going to bring something to the Lord, I have to bring at least these two coins. If I take these two coins, I'm not going to have anything left. And so there was something inside of her. I, I, again, put yourself there. And you just realize... I want to go worship today. I want to go with my people to worship my God. It's going to cost me everything to go. And she began to weigh her options. It's interesting because in the Hebrew, which is what the Old Testament is written in, when it talks about glory, the word for glory is also the word for weight. What you put weight on is what you give glory to. What outweighs something else has more glory than the other thing. And so she weighed her options. Which part of my life is going to get the glory? This was a spiritual decision. I know. It's easy to make this about money. I'm, this is not a giving. I'm not, I'm not preaching about money, okay? Money is one of the ways we worship. That's not what this is about. This is a spiritual decision of what's going to get glory. Who's going to get glory? What's going to weigh more than everything? Because Jesus made it very clear, this is all she had to live on. Her offering... When she walked into the temple and she walked past all the other people who had plenty to give and to go in and worship freely without worrying about anything else when they got home, when she walked in and she put those two little coins in, that was her life. It was her dinner. It was probably the bed that she was going to sleep on that night. It was her rent payment. Her whole life, everything she had to live on, she put it into the box to worship God. Something inside her spirit said, I must worship God. Everything else can be second. That's a lot of weight. The worship weighed the most. God had to get the glory. And I can't help but contrast this spirit of this widow with the spirit of the church of today. I see it on you know, Facebook. Somebody posted a few Sundays ago. I saw it and I thought, well, that's funny. And then I thought, it's true. And it's funny because it's true. And then I stopped laughing because of how true it was. And it was this. They say that it takes 100 gallons of water to baptize a person and a few drops of rain to keep them out of church. I know. Let that land for a second, right? (laughs) Literally. Literally. There can be a couple of clouds and a couple of drops on the windshield and people will turn around and walk right back in the house. They can look at their app when they wake up and go, well, there's a 10, 15% chance of rain today. Let's, you know... Let's, let's not deal with that today. I won't stop them from going out to eat or going to the mall later, but it will keep them out of church. It's funny how that works, isn't it? Fair weather 
is the lowest barrier to being with the body of Christ. And let's face it, that's what the church is. The church is the body of Christ. The church, the gathering, what you're sitting in right now is the gathering of the body of the one that we love. And for some, it just takes a few little drops of rain or the promise of a few little drops of rain to keep them out and away from the body. Yeah. The weather is the lowest possible barrier. Now, unless you're talking about tornadoes and ice storms and all that, okay, I get, I get that. We'll, we'll, we'll change for your safety and your protection. Okay, I get it. I'm, I'm just talking about basic stuff, okay? That's the lowest possible barrier there is. Wake up, look out the window and go, mm, there's some clouds, I'm not going to today. Okay, that's the low, lowest barrier to going to church. You know what the second one is? I guess it's what time the church service is. Over the last three weeks, we've had one service at 9 o'clock. I'm glad it's over. And next Sunday's going to be 1030 because people will come back to church. I'm serious. I'm, I am so glad that it's over. I'm ready to see everybody. It's like it, it, there, are, there are people, uh, well, all of us, every morning weigh what we're going to do in the name of the Lord. We weigh it, and what weight do we give it, and which one weighs the most? Look, I, I think it's worth noting that Jesus is watching the spirit in which we worship. And I want to worship in a way that gives Jesus all the weight, everything. If I've had a rough week, I will worship. That means I'm going to be in church, I'm going to give, I'm going to serve, I'm going to praise him, I'm going to love on other people, I'm going to do all those things. Why? Because he outweighs all of my frustration. If I'm sick and not contagious, I'll be doing those things. If I'm worried, I'm going to be worshiping. If we yelled at each other on the way to church, and then we put on a smile when we walked in the church doors... And me and the spouse knows it, and the kids know it, and nobody else knows it, but Jesus, we're going to worship. Yeah. If I stayed up a little too late last night, I'm going to worship. If I got a little headache, I'm going to worship. If I lost my job, I'm going to worship. If I got some bad news, I'm going to worship. And what if I'm just tired and I need to rest? That's fine. I'm gonna, if I need to rest, I will rest at the expense of everything else but worship. I'll worship first and then I'll rest. In fact, my rest will actually be a form of worship when I get done with that. So you can write this down if you're taking notes or in your phone, if you're just putting some things down as we go. Uh, worship is, is a spiritual decision. It is spirit. It has to do with your spirit. It is a decision you make with your spirit that nothing else will outweigh your worship to God because you want to live your life in a way that says, God, I want you to get the glory. I want you to outweigh everything else. It's spiritual. It's very, very spiritual. Now, that's what God is looking for. He's looking for people that will worship him in spirit and in truth. That's the spirit part. Spirit says, I want you to get the glory. Spirit says, I want you, you're more important than anything else. Now let's look at the truth part. Luke chapter 7, another story. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. This is a very loaded story. I'm just going to pull a couple of things out for you. This is... Story of a Pharisee, one of the religious leaders. His name is Simon, and he has a nickname, Simon the Leper. Now, if you know anything about leprosy, you know that if you had leprosy, nobody can be around you. So obviously he had leprosy, but now he did not. He was known as somebody that had leprosy, but now he did not. In fact, he had people coming to his house. He had Jesus coming to his house. That's fine. Jesus goes to everybody's house. But he also had other people there. Other people didn't go to lepers' houses. So he was healed probably by Jesus. Depends on which commentator you're reading. We don't know. 
possibly healed by Jesus. One of the Pharisees, whatever it was, God showed him mercy at the very least and didn't let him die from leprosy and he was healed. One of the Pharisees, that's Simon the leper, asked Jesus to eat with him, Luke 7, 36. Jesus, would you come and eat with me? And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at a table. And behold, while he's reclined at the table, while they're eating dinner, a woman of the city who was a sinner. Now, we read this story, and again, depending on which commentator you're reading, this could possibly be Mary Magdalene. It could, she had been filled with many demons, and Jesus had cast them out of her. Uh, she had committed many, many sins that was egregious and out there for everybody to see. It could have been her. One of, in fact, she, does, she is named in a story similar to this in one of the other Gospels, so this could have been a very similar thing, or it could have been a, a retelling of that same story. Uh, some say this was a, a woman who was known to be a sinner because she was a prostitute. Others just say that sinner just means heathen or Gentile or possibly even a Roman. Whatever it was, she was a sinner. And she was known by everybody to be a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at a table in the Pharisee's house, she found out that Jesus was at Simon the leper's house. She went there, and she brought an alabaster flask of ointment, precious oil, expensive oil. Uh, some of the other gospels say that this oil was so expensive it was worth a whole year's wages. How much do you make in a year? That's how much this cost. Precious stuff. And she stood behind him at his feet, and weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. She broke the seal, and poured it out, and put on this lavish display of affection, and adoration, and worship to Jesus. You can imagine this is quite a scene. Quite a scene. And when the Pharisee who had invited him, invited Jesus, saw this, he said to himself, notice he said it to himself. In other words, he thought it in his head, okay? If this man, I'm talking about Jesus, were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. In other words, if Jesus was everything that people said that he is, he would know what's going on because prophets... In the Old Testament, we're like that. They knew people's intentions. The Spirit would reveal people's intentions to them before everybody else, before even words are spoken. I love the next verse, verse 40. Jesus answering. <laughs> what did he answer? He answered the thought that was in the Pharisee's head. Jesus answered his thought and said, Hey, Simon, I got something to say to you. You don't think I'm a prophet. Well, this is what a prophet does, right? Simon said, say it, teacher. So Jesus says, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 dinar, the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Well, we have two people. One owes 500 of these coins. The other owes 50. Neither one can pay. And so this man cancels the debt of both. 500 coins, don't worry about it anymore. Wow, thank you. 50 coins, don't worry about it anymore. Wow, thank you. Jesus asked, now which one of them will love him more? Don't read the next verse. Just answer it for yourself. Which one will love him more? You're probably like Simon. Simon answered, the one that I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. In other words, you're correct. Then he turned towards the woman and he said to Simon, a very important question. Jesus did not ask, or Jesus did not answer a lot of questions, but he did ask a lot of questions. There's only a handful of questions that Jesus ever gave a direct answer to. Most of the time he answered questions with questions. This is a question that he asked. He turned to Simon. He says, do you see this woman? Obviously, he saw her because when she came in and started pouring oil on his feet and wiping uh, his feet with her 
uh, hair and crying over him and adoring him and worshiping. Everybody saw her. In fact, Simon said, doesn't he know that she's a sinner? But Jesus means something different. He says, do you see this woman? Do you see who she is? Do you see her spirit? You see all her past. You see all the tales that have been told about her. You, you see all of that. You see her reputation, but you don't see her spirit. He says, I entered your house. So he, he starts showing, this is how you're going to know that somebody's got the right spirit. It's by the fruit by they bear, by the way. I entered your house, Jesus said, and you gave me no water for my feet. That's a big hospitality faux pas, that you would come into somebody's house with dirty feet because they didn't have nice shoes like we do now. They, had, they were walking on dirt streets, and their feet were covered in dirt. So you'd have a servant wash their feet as a show of hospitality before they came in their house. You didn't do that for me. She's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You could have just had a servant do it with water and a towel. You gave me no kiss. That's... Uh, a way they greeted each other then. They, you can kiss them on the cheek. You didn't do that. But from the time that I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. Again, the lowest part of a person. You did not anoint my head with oil. Again, hospitality. But she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, in other words, I know what you know. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. Wow. Just let that settle on you for just a second. Because her spirit is right. Her sins are forgiven. He who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? They missed the whole thing. He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This tells us that this, this woman understood something about Jesus was stood in need of salvation, knew her sin, knew something about Jesus, and her spirit was drawn to him. And yes, would it be an embarrassment to walk into a house of a Pharisee as a sinner? Yeah. I'm going to go somewhere where everybody knows who I am, everybody knows what I've done, but I do know there's somebody in that house that can forgive my sins, that can heal my soul, they do so amazing things. I've heard them teach. I just got to get close to him. There's something in her spirit that said, I've got to get close to him and worship him. I don't care what everybody else thinks. I don't care what everybody else knows. I know what I know. I've got to get to him. So we, we've heard faith isn't known until it's tested. Right? You've ever heard that? Oh, I've got great faith. Well, let's put you through a trial and let's see. Life does that. You've heard it said, well, love isn't really revealed until it's tested. Right? It's easy to fall in love. It's harder to stay in love. It's easy to make the wedding vows. It's harder to keep them. We, we get that. We've heard that before. Well, worship isn't known. True worship isn't known until the truth is known. And the more we understand truth the more we understand worship. Because the more that we realize that we've been set free from, the more we cry out, the more we lift our hands, the more we move our feet, the more we say, God, you need to get the glory. Because here's the truth. Let me, let me just tell you the truth. When you repented of living life your way, and you went down in the watery grave of baptism. You were forgiven, and your sins were washed away, symbolically in the water, literally in the spirit. Have you, have you forgotten the rottenness of your sin? Have you forgotten the sexual promiscuity, drunkenness, uncontrolled anger, 
perverted thinking, the pornography that you consumed, the addictions that held you bound, the lying and the cheating wherever you wouldn't get caught, you know, the little white lies and the little cheating that didn't hurt anybody, or maybe it did, the self-assurance of just how good of a person you really were, still having that giant hole in your soul of, uh, with loneliness and hopelessness and a lack of true purpose, and the numbing that you would go through to all those things with just scrolling endlessly on social media and Netflix and eating ice cream. I'm, oh, sorry, I started preaching about myself. <laughs> you, were a, you were a sad sack, a sorry, pitiful case. There was nothing really to celebrate. You were on your way to the trash heap called hell. You were breathing and walking and talking through life, but you were dead through and through until God found you. Now, now you are loved. Are you perfect? No, probably not, but you're being transformed. You have a future and a hope. You're more than just a pretend good person with made-up values so that society will accept you. Uh, you have a spirit living inside of you, and you're beginning to bear spiritual fruit. It's different now. When you realize the truth of that, then that changes your spirit. When you realize what he has done and how much he cares for us and how much he loves us and what exactly he has done for us and what he wants to do through us, we see the truth of that. It ought to change our spirit to say, God, I want you to get the glory because I know the truth about you. I know I see what you're up to in my life. I see what you've brought me through. I see what you've done in me, and I want you to keep doing that. And I, I know in order to do that, everything in my life has to revolve around you getting the glory because you deserve it. We need to let the truth about God inform our spirit and add weight to our worship. Let truth add weight to our worship. We want to give him the glory with our whole life and being. I know there's a little bit to digest in this message today. You can take it home with you and chew on it a little bit. And maybe the Lord's dealing with you right now. I'm going to invite you to stand in the room. We're going to go into a time of worship. And I just want the, in this worship, I, I, here, here's the thing. This, the people that you see on the stage behind me, these are worship leaders, but the worship team is all of us together. All of us together. They're, they're leading, they're setting the beat and the tone and the, the key, but all of us are worshipers. And our worship will be true worship when we're doing it in truth knowing who God is and what he has done and allowing that to outweigh everything else. So I want to close today with this passage out of Psalm chapter 96. 96 verse 7, it says this, Ascribe to the Lord, O family of peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. In other words, declare how glorious he is. De declare how much weight he has. Declare his strength. Give him the glory and the weight due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. I'm not talking about money today. You already had a chance to give today. You can, if you forgot, you can give when you get home using the church center app. However you're gonna, that's fine. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about an offering of worship to God, which says, I know who you are and I know what you've done and I know what you can do. And that outweighs everything else in my life. So I'm going to worship you with everything that I am. I'm going to be faithful to the house of God. I'm going to serve in the house of God with joy in my heart. I'm going to Yes, give of my tithes and offerings. Yes, I'm going to show love to others. I'm going to do all those things before anything else because I want to get you the glory. That's what I want.